Well, bless the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We are so glad that the Lord led you to come back and be a part of Fresh Anointing Ministries service today. And I tell you what, this there is a word. Feel a little different, but I believe it's from the Lord. But let's go to the throne of grace right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for who you are and for what you've already done. You're always the honored guest in our services, Father. And look on your people everywhere. You always know their needs. You know their desires, oh God. Give them a mind today to seek you first in the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Open up our hearts to your word today. Let it fall on good ground, God. Bless the leaders in our government, our churches, our schools, our homes, everywhere, God. Thank you for your divine guidance. And we are receiving it and believing it in Jesus' name. Can you help me say amen and amen? Well, I tell you, this is the USA has said this is a special day today. Hallelujah. They call it Valentine's Day, but I say today and every day is love day. And that's our message today. Every day is a love day. And we're coming out of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 4 through 7. And you're familiar with this scripture. But we just don't want to kind of refresh you and stir up that pure mind to love. Amen. If you're turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, at 13th chapter. And let's start or take a look at that 4th through 7th verse. Those verses. Amen. Get your pencil and paper. A short pencil is better than a long memory. Praise the Lord. So, that's what it says. And we're going to use this word interchangeably, charity, and love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 starts out like this. Charity suffereth long and is kind, patient, envieth not. Praise the Lord. Doesn't vaunt itself. Is that what it says? It's not puffed up, not self abased then it goes on to say in that fifth verse, it says, doesn't behave itself unseemly. Seek it not her own, not easily provoked. Think it no evil. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 said love is. Then it says in the sixth verse, rejoiceth not in iniquity. Rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, that's what 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, kind of gives us a biblical definition of what love is and what love is not. But I want you to go now back up to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and look at verses 1 through 3 that's talking to us and preceding what they're saying about this love. Now, in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 1, 2 says, look at verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity or love, he says, I'm nothing but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In other words, love is more than just words. Love is an action. And you know, some people can talk, 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 talk love, praise the Lord. They can even sound sweet as angels, but have no love. And God says it like that in that first verse. He says that you can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if you don't have love, you're just making a bunch of noise. Isn't that something? Let's see what he says in 1 John 4, 18. 1 John 4 and 18 talks about this slick tongue. He says, when you truly have love, it says love casts out fear. Look, look, 1 John 4 and 18 said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Why? Because the scripture says, fear hath torment, and he that feareth 
it's not made perfect or complete. Have you ever been around people you're supposed to be in love, but you're walking on eggshells or that kind of thing? There's a fear, there's an element, a drawback. The scripture says, when true love is there, there is no fear in love. Because perfect love, complete love, casts out fear. Do you agree with that? Now, take a look at 1 Peter 4 and 8. If you don't have time to go back to that, write it down. Because you really need to go back and study these scriptures. In 1 Peter 4 and 8, it says, love not only casts out fear, but this particular scripture says, love covers rather a multitude of sin. Isn't that something? Love covers a multitude of sin. That's what 1 Peter 4 and 8 says. What is that really saying? It's saying you love a person, so it's almost like a mother's love. Praise the Lord. We're not advocating sinning, and we love you so much that you don't go and repent of sin. But you're not there to just expose and, and talk about and those kinds of things. Praise the Lord. So love covers a multitude of sin. It's just like Jesus did. We were nothing but sinners. But John said in St. John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, did you hear that? His only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, he loved us so, he saw our sin, he sent us an advocate. He sent us a person that could deliver us from sin and not only cover it with his righteousness but gave us an opportunity to repent of it well you need to memorize saint john three sixteen. that's his sacrificial love he loved us so that he gave us an opportunity to get into the kingdom of god and i like what galatians galatians the first chapter and the fourth verse talks about it like this jesus gave his life that we might live this is why we love him so. This is why we encourage you to love him, to, to, to have the actions of love, to enough love that you go and witness to the people who have not heard about him before. Now, look with Colossians, the third chapter, verse 14. I said, love cast out fear. Love co covers a multitude of sin. I said, Jesus gave his life that we may live. John 3, 16, talk about how God loved us. But in Colossians, the third chapter, verse 14, said love somewhat brings unity. He says, and above all things, praise the Lord, forgive one another, forbear one another. You see, forgiveness is a powerful tool, powerful tool. And it's not so much for the other person, it's for the individual. Do you hear what I'm saying? So love brings unity unity. Now, let's go back now to 1 Corinthians, that 13th chapter, verse 2, because we said in verse 1, you can speak with tongues and you like angels and, and, and professional people, but if you have not love, he said you're just a sounding bread and a tempting symbol that making nothing but noise. But in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, now watch this closely. He has, he said, though I have the gift of prophecy, I can understand mysteries of the Bible, and I have all kind of knowledge and all kind of faith, enough faith to move mountains. He says, but if we don't have love, we don't have nothing. That's worth listening to. Some people can prophesy, can preach, can go through the Bible and understand mystery, but they have no love. And God says, if you don't have that love, you don't have anything. And when he got through with 1 Corinthians 13, chapter verses 1 and 2, then he went on to tell us possibly, and I know he did, what love is and what love is. We should also make a checklist of 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, and ask ourselves, do I possess this? Do I want to keep this? Do I want to get rid of this? The scripture tells us, tells us to judge ourselves, and we will not be judged. Amen? Now, all of that prophecy and speaking and those kind of things, that falls under the heading 
a false profession. Say that. False profession if you don't have love. Praise the Lord. Now let's see what that false profession is. If you take a look at Psalm 78 verse 36, a person that's uh, professing falsely is one who flatters with their mouth and lies with their tongue. Now, the, the, the Bible is so unique. Sometimes there are things that's complicated in there, but praise the Lord, that scripture says, you're talking really out of both corners of your mouth. You flatter with your mouth, but you're lying with your tongue. That's false profession. Look what Proverbs 26 and 23 says. Proverbs 26 says this false profession calls you to have burning lips, but a wicked heart, a wicked heart. And it's like a potsherd covered with silver dross. In other words, all of that stuff is just covered with dawn. Eee, praise the Lord. Look at Matthew 7 and 21. Now, this is worth really listening to about this false profession. Doing all of this talk, doing all of this teaching, doing all of this prophesying, evangelistic and everything. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Why? He says, but is he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's worth thinking about. Because there are a lot of people in churches doing church chores, going around from church to church, preaching to other folks, and their heart is hardened. There is no charity. There is no love. And yet you're saying, Lord, have mercy. You're saying God is good, and he's saying what? They are persons that are saying, Lord, Lord, he says, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is something that we should judge ourselves. But we don't need anybody else to judge us. Praise the Lord, because we know our own heart. And look what Titus, in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 16 says, They profess to know me, but in their works they deny me. He said, how? They are doing things that's abominable. They are disobedient. And, and their lifestyle demonstrates one that is a reprobate. You said, well, what is abominable? Those things that just stink in the nostril of God. It's an abomination. And you already know what being disobedient is. Praise the Lord. And, and it's a person, a reprobate is a person who's undisciplined in your principles. You taught one thing and do another. And Titus 1, 16 said, they profess to know me, but their works don't match up. I heard a minister say, if you were accused of being a Christian, would you have enough evidence to be convicted? If you were accused of being a Christian, would they find enough evidence to convict you? So you don't want your speaking and you're living to be going in different directions. Amen? So now, that's powerful. That's biblical. Those are scriptures. But today, as I said, people are talking about Valentine's Day. Even church people. But are there other kinds of love other than this spiritual love? I ask you a question. Everything should be incorporated into your spiritual love? But the answer is yes. You know, in my own personal life, I had really known the four major kinds of love. But in my study for the message today, praise the Lord, there were several loves that I hadn't even realized. Praise the Lord. So let's address these and see if we as Christians can know the benefit for ourselves and if there are other kinds of love or descriptive love that we can make us better. Let's take this journey together and see what are some of these other kinds of love to evaluate ourselves, to see if we fit there, or can we make ourselves better. Now, these words fall into the Greek and Hebrew, and I'm going to try to pronounce them as much as I can. But we're going to talk about agape. We've heard of that. We're going to talk about philia, P-H-I-L-I-A. We're going to talk about pragma, P-R-A-G-M-A. We're going to also describe storage, 
S-T-O-R-G-E, or store J. We're going to talk about Eros, E-R-O-S. There's one called Ludus, L-U-D-U-S. Mania, M-A-N-I-A. And Phalantia, P-H-I-L-A-U-T-I-A, in case you want to go back and study those kinds. Let's go into a little bit more detail and find out if there are other loves that's surrounded with our biblical and spiritual love. Let's take, for example, agape. That's the unconditional godly love. It's our spiritual love. It's our sacrificial love. It, it, it's the love that we've already been talking about found in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Kind, patient, long-suffering, not puffed up, doesn't bunt itself. It's, it's the God kind of love, the kind of love that God gave us by giving his son. That's, that's agape love. Put this scripture, 1 Corinthians 4, 13, 4 through 7. You know, that's our scripture that we were studying today. Go back and study that agape love. Now, let me take my time and let's talk about Philea. P-H-I-L-I-A. So I'll put an E on it to it. Philea. That's that affectionate love toward our friends. It's, it's what we call deep friendship. It's love without the sexual act. Look what Romans 12 and 10 tells us. Romans 12, 12 and 10 tells us be kindly affectionate one to another. In other words, it's saying love your neighbor just like your family. Spend time with your closest friends. That's that kind of love. Have you experienced that? Sometimes I think one Bible verse says you're closer to your neighbor than, to, than you are to some of your friends. Sometimes we have a better relationship with our friends than we do with our family. So that's a description of that. Now, I ask you a question. Do you have that kind of love? Do you possess agape love? Let's go to the next kind of love I found in my research as I was studying the Word of God. It's called pragma, P-R-A-G-M-A. This is this love that's enduring. Say enduring. It's an enduring love. It's the love that has matured and develop over a long period of time. It's usually that kind of love that's found in a marriage where people have been together 30, 40, 50, 60 years. You see what I'm saying? They have been through uh, things that they have compromised on. They've kind of worked things out. People who've been married and they understand each other. They are committed. Now listen to this. This is a kind of love that has matured and it's not necessarily one based on a lot of intimacy and passion, but they have stood the test of time. <clears throat> they can almost speak for one another. It's called enduring love. It's stabilized over time. There is somewhat of a connection. That's why it's so important that when you're choosing mates or when you're seeking God about a mate, take your time and know one another. Know the likes, the dislikes, the beliefs, those kind of things. Now, there is no perfect relationship. There is no perfect marriage. But you can work things out <clears throat> and move it into this kind of love, Philea. Now, agape. Phileo, the maturing love. Let's go to storage, S-T-O-R-G-E. Now, this kind of love is more like a parent, child, brother, sister relationship. Hopefully you do have that in your family. It's no sexual or physical attraction, or it shouldn't be. But it's a strong, familiar kinship. Do you have that? When you grow up in a home with brothers and sisters or you develop a home with children, that kind of love or this kind of love shall, should be in this home. Luke 8, 40 through 56, talks about Jairus. You know the story. He had a sick daughter. 
there was a kind of relation there. There was a there was an empathetic, sympathetic relationship there that parent <clears throat> should have. And then also in St. John the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 44, I gave you those scriptures so that you can go back and read them. This kind of love was exemplified <clears throat> through Martha and Mary <clears throat> for their brother Lazarus. You know the story. But this kind of love works to strengthen a relationship. The relationships in a home, within a family, should be strengthened. Then we ask ourselves, do I have that in my family? And if I didn't know if I did, am I replicating that in my own personal family? That's a kind of love, but it can be wrapped up in this agape love. Because without God, without faith, it doesn't matter. Amen. We've got to have the love of God to do the other kinds of love here. Do you agree with that? Then, of course, most people know about Eros. Or some say Eros, E-R-O-S. That's that romantic, passionate, or physical love. Now, I couldn't find a lot of scriptures in the Bible uh, on this other than in the book of Solomon, Songs of Solomon. Now, some authors say this kind of love burns hot and bright, but it burns out fast. Did you hear that? So you can't base a maturing love based on this one. Amen? Let's go to Songs of Solomon in that first chapter, verses 1 through 2. Solomon, first chapter, verses 1 through 2. This is where Solomon, the book of Solomon, was explaining to them that the, the love, I, I think he was talking about the song of Solomon, which is about she kissed him and she felt passionate about, he felt passionate about her. Y'all read that? That was the only part or only section in Songs of Solomon where it demonstrated this particular kind of love. But now let me explain this to you. In marriage, God approves of this kind of love. There should be an emotional and an intimate and passionate relationship in a marriage of love. That's eros. Amen. Now, I told you about storage. I want to take my time. It's storage. That's between brothers and sisters, parent and child. There's that agape love, praise the Lord, that all of us should have. Then we talked about phileo, which is a friendship love with your best friends or your friends. Then we talked about that uh, play, pragma love. That's for maturing people. And hopefully the beginning that I'm getting ready to talk about now, this L-U-D-U-S, Ludus kind of love. Now this Ludus kind of love is what, and you probably remember a long time ago when you were young, they called it puppy love. My research called it infatuation or playful or get it this, you know, the crush that you get. It's not serious, but it can mature to these other kinds of love. Praise the Lord. So you have to remember. Now, it's one thing that I want to say about this. Uh, I want to kind of detour a little bit. Because this playful love or this infatuation or this, uh, uh, what I want to call it, giddiness can go into another kind of relationship. And as I was studying this, then I went to find out that you can take this particular love and move it to something stronger. Then I began to see what an author named Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S, said. You can take this playful love and move it to a seriousness and you can tell when it's moving to seriousness because you have fun. Now, this is my detour. You have fun with the person that you're talking to. Even if the task that you are on may not be funny or may be serious, but you're yet having fun with this particular person. So that stage is, is moving from giddiness, is moving from infatuation, is moving to something more serious. Then you can tell when a relationship is getting stronger. They say, if they look at you a lot, 
if they look at you a lot. The author said they pay more attention to you. They show empathy in either good situations or bad situations. And then they remember the little things. Do you get it? The little things. Then they began to introduce you to people who's more important to them. They started introducing you to their friends or to their families. And then they start talking about things in the future with you. Now, that kind of stemmed, or I made a detour from this ludus kind of love, which is, I said, playful or infatuation or giddiness, but it can get serious. Now, there are some loves that's not too good, not wonderful, but it's a kind of love. Now, this one is called Mania, M-A-N-I-A, and you can almost tell where I'm going with this. It's really not a good type of love because it's a love of possessiveness and obsession. Do you hear that? There's a lot of jealousy, envy, and anger in this type of relationship. We call it toxic or codependent. And the reason for this kind of love is there's an element of insecurity and then there's a fear of losing that person. Really, it's an imbalance in affection. That's a kind of love that we probably have observed during our day and time. But it's one that you have to watch the red flags. If you're dating and you start seeing that anger, that imbalance of affection, that possessiveness, that's a red flag. And you don't need to hook up with that person. Amen? I am encouraging you with this type of love. Notice any kind of behavior of possession or obsession. And then keep in mind that those things I told you previously, when a person is really getting interested in you, because that's important. Amen? Then, I talked about agape love that we all should have, phileo love, affection towards your friends. Then I talked about pragma love, that's that enduring love which really God loves. He, you know, he, he's not a person or a God that uh, likes divorce, even though it happens and is forgiveness for it. But he loves that maturing love. Amen. You learn to compromise and, and, and balance your love off. Then you know the love that you have, parent-child love, a brother-sister love. Then, of course, the romantic and affectionate and passionate and physical love that should be in everybody's uh, marriage. God has no problem with emotional and physical love in a marriage. Then I talked about that Ludus love that is playful infatuation or what we call in our day puppy love. Then, of course, I'm telling you now about mania. It's very important that you watch this. And I really don't want to put it in love because that's really not love. That's not love. Amen. Whew. That's trouble. Those are problems that can stem from the partners down to the children over into the churches your jobs your school why because you carry that thing you possess it amen then of course this one philosia p-h-i-l-a-u-t-i-a that's the kind of love that we call people who are narcissists my research says they are narcissists or they stuck on themselves. They are showing they want all the love to go toward them. You have to watch that kind of thing. It's me, myself, and I. If it's not my way, it's the highway. Those two right there, those are the red flag kinds of love you just don't want to be a part of. And if you find yourself in those kind of, seek help. Seek God. There's nothing wrong with seeking 
therapeutic help. Amen. Now, I told you about the different loves. I told you the biblical love. Hallelujah. It's nothing about love. It makes you look good. It makes you feel good. It gives you that good inward uh, motivation. And you hear me say this word a lot, empowerment. It gives you that empowerment when you know that you are loved. That's why I talk about the love of Jesus, because we can do anything with Jesus. He's our help. He's our empowerment. He, he's a very present help, the scripture says, in the time of trouble. And then he has no problems with us with these other kinds of love other than the last two that I talked about. Amen. Now, there was an author that you're probably familiar with, and I've gotten familiar with, and his name is Dr. Gary Chapman. Since this is Love Day, my message today is every day is a love day, not just this quote Valentine's Day. But Gary Chapman has done some research on love, and as I was reading that, I began to study his. He's called it the language of love. He says, each person either give or receive love in different ways. And so if you want to be effective in your relationships, just take a look at these. I'm not uh, endorsing his book. I'm just throwing out information. You know, I always encourage you to go and study for yourself. Amen. And he talked about, I think he put them into five categories. And as I give you some definitions of these categories, find out which one applies to you. And if your partner or your spouse is not meaning that, use your mouth to say, this is what I like. Now, they tell me he has a survey or test that can kind of help you or gear, guide you into that direction. I have not taken it. But these are the categories. Listen to me closely. Number one, he said there are persons out there who just love words of affection. Are you that kind of person? Because if you don't get those words of affection, you just feel like you're not in love. And that person may love you. You see, words of affection. They love to hear, quote, I love you. They love to hear positive kinds of compliments. You know, that looks good. Or, you you sure did clean up well. Or, you're just so helpful to me as a spouse. You see, those are words of affection. And you need to find out if your partner, your wife, or your husband, or your child, you know, whomever you're in that relationship with, according to God's will, find out that's the kind of love that empowers them, then use it. Do it. Then there's another category he said was called acts of service. Acts of service. These are the people that like doing things for other people, and they like other people doing things for them. When they do things for other people, they are happy. They don't care if you tell them you love them or not. They'll receive it. But that's not the thing that empowers them and make them feel loved. Then you have those in the category of who like to receive gifts. They value receiving gifts. And they also value giving gifts. They like to see the emotions, I guess, from other people. If you have a partner that values that, then you better make sure you got some pennies on you because there are some who like giving gifts and they like receiving gifts. Then there are some who love receiving gifts and don't want to give a gift, but it should be reciprocated. So you need to find out, is this the language of that person? Things could work out so much smoother. Then there are those who like quality of time. If you love me, give me some of your time. How much time that partner gives them and spend with them is a test to this kind of person's love language. You see what I'm saying? There are some can stay away and they don't even care. But then there are those who love, now watch this, quality time. It's not necessarily a lot of quantity time, but when you are there, you, have, you show them attention. You give them what they, what they need. And if they don't get this together time, they may feel unloved. But if you don't know that, 
you may be sending off negative reinforcements that they don't know about. That's why communication is so important in relationships. Amen. And then, of course, that fifth category, you got those who love physical touch. They want a whole hand. They want you to cuddle with them. They want you to rub their back. They love those intimate encounters. Now, you need to find these things out maybe before you get married. Because if you say, well, I'm not that kind of person, and you got, it's not, there are going to be problems in that thing. You see what I'm saying? So this may not be so biblical, but I tell you what, it's spiritual. <laughs> it's spiritual. And I'm the kind of pastor, I like to talk about it all. When God called me into ministry, he said, grow my people. And he said, do it. Talk about the physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, all of those. I said the whole L.Y. family. He doesn't want his children walking sideways. They are so spiritual, they aren't any earthly good. So this is an opportunity for me to just kind of talk with you about the emotions, about the spiritual, about the romantic. If you don't know how, go read Songs of Solomon. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, what are these languages? Words of affection. And then you may be one like all five. Well, my God, you better have you somebody that you're told, I want some affection. I want some service. I want, I want you to get in the kitchen and help me wash the dishes. I want you to do this. I, I want to give gifts. I like to receive. You know, it doesn't have to be expensive. Just the thought that you are thinking about me. I like quality time. If we're not doing things, we're just sitting out in the yard in the sunshine. We don't have to go away on vacations. We can do a stay vac staycation, they call it. Or just sit and watch a movie. Play a game. Or just sit and talk. Quality time. And you have to not only just do that with your children, I mean with your spouse, but you need to also do that with your children. This is what the, I told you it was a word from God today. And I really didn't know how to condense it down because there is so much about this thing of love. But hopefully what I've shared with you has been important, has reached you, so that you'll be able to apply what the Word of God is saying. And I tell you what, as I wrap it up, on this every day is a love day. Remember this. St. John 15 and 13 says it like this. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for a friend. And I told you Sunday before last, when two people are married, it should be heaven on earth in that home. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. You need to go back and read that entire 13th chapter. But 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, in the 13th verse, 13, 13. He said, now abide in faith, hope, and charity. He said, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, which is love. So as I leave you this afternoon, love your neighbors. The scripture says, love God. And love your neighbor as yourself because what the world needs now is love, love, love. And let every day be a love day. Amen and amen. Give God a hand praise for love. Amen. And if you out there, I always like, don't like to close the service today without giving you an opportunity to give your life to the Lord. And if you out there, say, Lord, forgive me. Say, thank you for the love that you're offering me today. Say, I repent of my sins. I surrender. I want to be on the Lord's side today. Say, save me. Deliver me. And if you've done that, because he said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. And if you believe that today, then welcome into the family of God. And it's the same thing for the sick and shut in. His love can just heal you, can surround you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we encourage you, go back and watch these tapes. Go back to our YouTube page and just let this 
message penetrates you in Jesus' name, amen and amen. We pray that you've enjoyed the word of the Lord brought to you by our pastor, Dr. Florine T. Milligan. Uh, right now, we'd like to give you the opportunity to pay your tithes or give your offering or even sow a seed uh, using the Fresh Anointing Ministries app that is now available for download. And to tell you more about that, here is Kevin Bingham Jr. Make sure you download the Fresh Anointing Ministries Incorporated app on Android. And also make sure you download it on the Apple App Store. Make sure to send a prayer request and also get involved in the FAM service. Make sure to go to our Facebook page. And also make sure to go to our YouTube page. And also subscribe to the Fresh Anointing Ministries channel. And now here's my little brother Paul. Fresh Anointing Ministries, where the Spirit of the Lord flows freely.